Linux Conf Australia 2017 Games Miniconf. Um, right now we have Josh. Uh, he's going to talk to us about his uh, open programming environment inspired by programming games, which is mostly based on Shenzhen IO, I believe. Um, Josh is an SRE at Google. That's why he couldn't get stuff to work, I guess. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, Josh. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, but it's working now, so I'm going to let Josh take it away. <laughs> Yeah, I was I was using um, some beta software to store my file in the cloud. So, <laughs> bold move, Cotton. Um, so about me, I work at a small internet startup, um, and in my in my spare time, I, I have a number of hobby projects. One is my web comic, Awake Man. You should definitely go and read it, and occasionally play it because it's sometimes a game. This makes me a game developer. This is <laughs> yeah, that's right. Following, following uh, John's advice of plugging, plugging myself whenever I can. OK, so programming games, what are they about? Well, programming is work, and I kind of enjoy my work. You may be wondering how I got that way. Um, the answer is, well, when I was well, about 19 years ago, I um, got into programming via QBasic because it let me cheat at nibbles. <laughs> Um, it's, Nibbles is not a programming game, so I'll skip over that. Um, I want to talk about games where programming is a core mechanic of the game. All right, this is distinct from many games which happen to somehow implement a Turing machine or just have it as an incidental mechanic, like Minecraft. You can play Minecraft, your game of Minecraft will in no way be impeded if you don't do any programming in it or if you don't ever touch redstone. Um, so, some examples of things which I consider programming games because programming is over core mechanic. Here we have Hack and Slash. It's a top-down RPG. While the game um, starts out not letting you actually hack very much, by the end you have to change the Lua code of some of the game objects using in-game mechanics in order to win the game and progress the story. This is TIS 100. It's by Zachtronics. Um, and is a programming puzzle game and it's based on a fictitious massively parallel computer where you're uncovering pieces of the story by fixing parts of the computer, fixing parts of the software which have been corrupted. So as compared to say Hack and Slash which was on the previous slide, this puts the code front and centre at all time. There's basically no other mechanic in this game than programming. Similarly we have Shenzhen IO, um, also by the same company, Zachtronics. Um, it's another programming puzzle game, um, but you have a bit more flexibility in this one. You're working uh, as a circuit designer for a futuristic Chinese company, hence the name, and you have to create circuits out of virtual microcontrollers. Doing this, again, gradually unfurls the story. So, why did I want to talk about this game, or rather, why did I get addicted to it? First of all, it's a game, <laughs> of course. Uh, and it encourages play and experimentation. And there's a sandbox for playing around with the different parts that it offers. Um, puzzle solutions, in order to progress the story, require a bit of experimentation sometimes. So here's a screenshot of something I made in the sandbox. It's called Tap a Pixel. Um, there's a random noise generator and a little microcontroller on the right that basically turns dots on. And when the screen detects the user tapping on a dot, if it, the dot was on, then it increments the score and displays it in the bottom. Here's another reason why um, it's cool. It's visual. And this is probably the key thing about this, um, about games um, on computers generally, but especially here. Components of wires are laid out visually atop a small circuit board that acts as the anchor for your design. You could think of the inputs and outputs as anchors for your design as well. The game also visually shows the movement of signals between the components and along the wires. So for instance, when this is run, you see little pulses of light coming in from the control in, passing into the microcontroller, and then pulsing out. As such, I think this um, has all the requirements of, for what Simon Wardley would call a map. <laughs> Simon Wardley is a strategy guy, and he has a big belief in his uh, mapping technique. And I've been reading him quite a lot, and I think he's onto something. Um, so he has a, a number of criteria. Those visual, context-specific shows, components, um, position relative to an anchor, and movement. So that's basically all of them. Let's compare this to regular um, traditional code. The Shenzhen IO way of crafting solutions is markedly different to this. 
Here we see um, some code that is, OK, it's, it's laid out top to bottom. It's got some structure there. We see some indentation. And we see some of the code has got different colors to other code. But it's not actually all that visual. And if we want to figure out the path through some traditional code, we, it's often inscrutable. We often end up in a spaghetti code situation and have no idea where we are. Even when we use visual aids like unified modeling language diagrams or function calls or um, entity relationship data diagrams in databases, um, they're often done post facto. They're done after the code is written. They're done, they can become kind of out of sync with the code. They're okay. So basically, a code that we think of today is, is not all that visual. Um, and as delightful as Visual Studio Code is, kudos to Microsoft on that one, um, it's not a very visual thing. So back to Shenzhen I.O. then. It doesn't just have visual editing of your designs. It also has a visual testing. Here we see a waveform, which shows the input to the um, problem and the desired output. And when we get the, um, when we get the solution right, we see that the um, actual output and the expected output just overlap nicely. And when they don't overlap, then there's a little bit of red in the line. And so you can see exactly when it failed and by how much it failed. So as a, a game design critique, there's uh, several aesthetics that I really enjoy about Shenzhen IO. Um, here's, here's just a few of them. I'm not going to read them all out. I'd like to call out uh, strategy, though. Um, this is to do with the fact that it's like a Wadley map. And uh, enlightenment, um, this is part of the, I guess, the moral of the story is that often the textbook solution to a problem is wrong. Often the wrong part has a crazy, wild, useful use case that would save you a lot of time. There are a number of really cool things people have made in Shenzhen IO. You can play, um, <laughs> someone made a game of a clone of Tetris and a clone of Snake in the sandbox. There are also sand covers because one of the parts is a uh, FM synthesizer. It's where you send um, commands to say, I'm going to play this instrument now, and here are the notes. Um, now, because I'm running off. Uh, Conference Wi-Fi, I'm not actually going to open any of these YouTube videos. But if you'd like to see them, just Google for them. They're great. Um, there are a few other things that are not related to what I'm going to talk about next. Um, what I do think are cool are the unfolding narrative, um, the way the narrative arrives via emails from your colleagues, um, and also via the PDF manual, which is indispensable to playing the game, and also the solitaire mini game, which you can obtain separately. Um, the things, though, that um, frustrate me as a, a developer um, are really the things that are required because it's a puzzle game with achievements on Steam. So it's not open source. That would lend itself to cheating and probably to piracy as well. Um, the designs are constrained to a small area. This is very frustrating when you want to do something large and complicated. Um, the designs only run as fast as your game engine, so it's got to check the rules, for instance. Um, and the parts are quite limited. We see here, like, the bre um, bread and butter microcontroller for, from the game only fits nine lines of code in it. And they're also quite short. So my wish list would be, well, let's have something that's open source. <laughs> if it wasn't open source, then I wouldn't be up here talking uh, about whatever it is I'm about to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> A language that's more popular. Um, and so on and so forth. These are basically just the opposites of my frustrations. Um, and one other thing that I didn't mention before is that it would be awesome if my day job was more like programming in Shenzhen IO rather than programming in spaghetti code. <coughs> and, well, yes, it's a puzzle game. It's not an open programming environment. What did you expect, Josh? Well, I'm a developer. I can write something. One observation led me down the path of implementing what I did. Here we have two Shenzhen IO microcontrollers. They're connected via the XBus pins. What's XBus? Well, it's a communication protocol. And all it basically says is you can send a number as long as something's going to receive the number at the same time. If you don't have that property, then the microcontrollers block, and then the game stops the solution from progressing. It's quite simple. It's a blocking communication. This, unsurprisingly, is almost exactly the same as a Go channel operation. Uh, Go routines communicate via channels. Um, here they're depicted by cute gophers. 
although they don't actually look like that in practice, they do have the same property that if you write to an unbuffered channel, you can't um, complete the write until something has also read from the unbuffered channel at the same time. So, do we just add them together and get Chen Chen Go? Well, I, I guess we do, because that's what I wrote. <laughs> Um, it's open source, it's on GitHub today, it's on GitHub, GitHub a week ago actually. Um, it's cross-platform, uh, although I've only ever run it on Mac OS. It should theoretically work on Linux, there's nothing in there that should stop it working on Linux. Uh, it's written in Go as well. It um, presents to the user a visual environment for editing a Go program, based around this idea of connecting paths together with wires, I guess. Um, you can also get around um, some of the limitations of Shenzhen IO because there's not a puzzle involved, there's no motivation to have a limited area or a limited parts. And because it's open source, um, you can define your own parts. Um, and something else that um, you might think of, well, okay, yes, a compiler could give it spits out like machine code and then you can just edit the machine code. But this is a bit different, like this spits out a Go program that implements your design. So it's kind of open in layers. You can just take the built design that you've created, convert it into Go, and then never touch the visual design again. Um, anyway, uh, it's demo time, so let's uh, see if I can get this going. Oh dear. Ah, here we go. Oh, here we go. All right, so this is the program running. I've got like a little file browser here. I'm going to go to the um, source code, which is in the standard Go package layout. And so there's, there's the code for it, just as you would get from GitHub. In the examples, I have a prime number generator. So when I click on that, hey presto, there it is. It's a graph, um, which is um, displayed via GraphViz inside some like a basic web browser. This is all an pr experimental prototype. I really want to Im improve the UI quite a lot. But if we have a look here, so we've got, um, it generates some integers and it tests if they're divisible by two, if they're divisible by three, and then by five, and then um, it's cut off by the scroll, but yeah, there's an output printer at the bottom. And if we run this, we should see some prime numbers. Yeah, they're not very big, but they're there. That's the output from the code, yeah. And back, back to regular size. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, this thing generates some integers. It's uh, got a for loop in it, and it sends the integers to this channel called raw, and then when it's done, it closes the channel. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, but what if I wanted to say write to a different channel? Well, I guess I'll just try, I don't know, replace this with another channel that I happen to have one called div2 in here. And then if I, oh, let's cut off the, um, let's cut off the save. Let's try and edit that. So if I go back. Now it's updated the diagram. I didn't have to pick the channel that I was writing to. It extracted that from an abstract syntax tree that it parsed out of the code that I write. This is because the Go compiler is open source and you can just import the parser as a package. Very useful. Um, here we have some um, more specific parts. These aren't just snippets of Go. They're uh, actually um, a custom implemented part that I wrote which does filtering. So here you pick an input from the available inputs and an output and any predicate, um, just a Boolean expression that you want, anything that matches this to be sent down that output. And I could add more outputs if I wanted or remove them, that sort of thing. We can also see the output of um, the editor as a Go program. And although it's um, not the prettiest or the best way of implementing the code, um, it does work, or it did work, because <laughs> I, I edited it, now I don't want to edit it back. Um, and it's, it's the parts of it are presented alphabetically as to contrast with the more strategic 
flow of information view that we have before. So yeah, that's it. Um, now, I'm just going to close that. And we should be able to go back to the Prezzo. Where to from here? Well, I have many big plans for this. Um, I'd like to um, make it far more useful and more fun at the same time. Uh, I plan to do this by adding more parts. Um, more things to do with input and output, so something that reads from files, something that writes to databases, something that serves web requests, that sort of thing. I have plans for the UI. I'd like to be able to have a drag and drop parts interface, kind of like Shenzhen IO. You can just dump on a part into the thing rather than having to go through a bit of HTML maze currently. And uh, I'd also like to implement the same visual unit testing idea where you can see um, which inputs are mismatching um, just there rather than having to dig into your tests. So uh, there's some links. The top's my GitHub repo, and the second one is the game that you should play. Thank you. Um, so I'll get John, do you mind, do you want to jump up and start setting your computer up? Uh, and do we have any questions for Josh? One down here. Oh, oh, sorry. I can look both ways, can't I? <laughs> Have you looked at any other flow-based programming systems and uh, what are the differences between those and what you've done? Yeah, so there's a couple. Um, there's sort of flowcharty ones, kind of like Twine for making games, where the control flow is the most important thing, effectively. Um, I've also played around with SQL Server integration services, <laughs> which is, <laughs> don't laugh, you can do a number of really incredible things with that thing. It's focused on both having a, a control flow and a data flow but they're two separate layers. With Go routines and channels, you can actually do both in the one graph. And this is something I want to explore a bit more. Um, I wonder if you've seen any of Brett Victor's videos about how he's done sort of a similar kind of approach. And in one of his demos, he does show like editing a game in motion, as it were. Mm. Funny you mentioned that. I just learnt about Brett Victor from Rommel earlier today. <laughs> I'm going to go look at some of these um, videos, definitely. Uh, thank you very much. So we've got a couple of minutes uh, before we move on to the next one. Testing, testing. Can you hear me? Beard scratch? Beard. Oh, that's lovely, isn't it? Sounds good. Yeah. Not getting beard pick up. Not too much. Beard pick up. Can you call it a beard if you want? Yeah, yeah, that could work. Weave it through the beard. Just have it stuck through the top. Yeah, I'm just poking out. That's a good idea. It's a terrible idea. Try and pull it out. Yeah. Oh, what have we got? So we've got I think we'll wait one more minute, that way we're close right. to actual schedule. He got set up too quickly. Too Still good. time for you to sing. Yeah, it's not happening. <laughs> what's John's favourite game? Yeah. Yeah, what's, what? <sighs> what's your favourite game, John? Or your favourite game at the moment? That's the first one I thought of. My favourite game at the moment is really tricky because I... <laughs> I have four kids. <laughs> <laughs> they play a lot of games, um, and sometimes I play games when they're in bed. 
<laughs> so, you know, um, Titanfall 2 is really Titanfall cool. Titanfall 2, yes. Um, it's very cool. I think the original Titanfall was a little bit underrated, and um, the second one is good. Um, XCOM 2 was brilliant. I wish I'd spent more time on that. Um, I still think I haven't played KSP in like I don't know how long, but I think about it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I just I think about not starting it because I don't have time for it at the moment, you know, but I really want to. I really want to. It has been three months since my last game of KSP. I'm not sure how long it's been, but it's <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, I think we'll get cracking again. Uh, we're more or less on time now.